So thank you also, Scott, for giving a good overview of EUAs, what they are and, and how they work. I guess really in the, sh in the short time I've got here, I want to talk about really giving you the banking perspective and why an EUA over any other form of finance. And hopefully I can cover that in the short time and avoid getting yellow or even worse, red carded. I'll skip over our lovely disclaimer and get to the core of the matter straight away. Why use an EUA over traditional debt? There's a number of benefits that come with an EUA. And this was at the core. When we were thinking of designing this and putting it together and really trying to unlock some of the barriers behind energy efficiency upgrades, we didn't want finance to be a barrier anymore. We wanted to remove them. So first off, there's no security with an EUA. You're not having to pledge your property or any other form of collateral or director's guarantees or anything else to actually get hold of the finance, uh, whereas traditionally you would have. There's also no covenants, no financial covenants, no regular ongoing reporting. Generally, when you take out traditional debt, there'll be some form of financial covenants in place in terms of debt service cover ratios, interest cover ratios, and other forms of covenants as well that sit beyond the financial metrics, dictating what you can and cannot do with your assets while you have a loan from the bank. So that goes away as well. And then there's the ongoing burden of reporting, generally on a quarterly basis. You have to make statements to your lender about where you stand, whether you've breached any covenants, where you stand, how much headroom there are. These all give a CFO, they love them. They love sitting down every month and writing out these reports. They think of nothing better. And so removing this, of course, was really tiresome for them. Um, we think it's a great benefit. There's also no refinancing risk. When you think of a traditional loan to the commercial property sector, it's generally on three-year terms, and quite often it's interest only. So every three years, that lender has to refinance and seek another loan to replace it. So they're exposed to interest rate risk, which can be quite volatile. Today, we're sitting at record low interest rates. Three years' time, who knows where we could be? So you get quite a lot of volatility. And when you're looking at an energy efficiency project, the whole point, as Scott was saying, is to bank the energy savings. And they're fixed. You know what they are in kilowatt hours. You know what energy savings you're banking. So if it's cash positive from day one, you don't want to be in a situation where three years later, because of a change in interest rates, suddenly this project isn't cash flow positive for you anymore. So it's incredibly important to keep it level. And finally, this part, this is the bit that makes my credit team nervous, there's no recourse to the lender. So traditionally, under normal debt, if you were to default on your loan, give it a, a very short period of time, we come knocking on your door. And there's a certain area of the bank that we affectionately call the bad bank, and unfortunately they come in and start having some rather awkward conversations with you. That goes away. There is no recourse. This is converted into a council charge, and the council charge is all it is. There's no loan documentation that says that we have access to that property. So we have to sit there and be incredibly patient and let it work its way through as it would with if you were to default on any other council charge, and that payment is due just to the council. It has a long tenor, like I mentioned, also very valuable for energy efficiency projects, which generally have a longer payback. So Scott mentioned lighting, which can have quite a short payback, but if you're looking at HVAC, boilers, chillers, etc., the paybacks are longer. Having that long tenor there can help align yourself to the depreciating value of those assets. It also gives you a really powerful tool for tenant engagement. Any upgrade is going to be saving the tenant money. And the, one of the key advantages of an EUA is breaking that split incentive and being able to share some of the benefits of an upgrade and align it to the burden of the finance itself. So this allows for a very transparent method. We recently did an EUA in New South Wales that was tenant driven. The tenant asked for the upgrade because for them the alternative was to move out to a higher rated building. And that would have cost them money, not just in moving out, but also move the premium of moving to a higher rated building when all they wanted was a small increase in efficiency. This allowed them to get that very transparent, transparently. They knew all they would be paying for with the energy savings, and they were protected from that. And it saved them having anything put into the base rent agreement, which would just notch up each year at 3 to 4% per annum. And finally, they do give improved financial performance compared to using, say, either debt or equity as well, and I'll talk through some of those. So first of all, they remove the split incentives. So we're going to have a quick look here 
We've got the building owner's economics, so this is from the building owner's perspective, over there on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, the tenant's perspective. So in a building where you do nothing, what happens over time? Well, for the building owner, nothing for the first few years. You haven't done anything, no real change. But over time, from the building owner's point of view, things get worse because the building stays the same and tenants begin to look and demand minimum neighbours' ratings and you potentially do not release. So to attract new tenants, you're having to offer discounts, maybe a, a rent-free rent -free periods, etc. So your economics decline. And for the tenants, they also decline over time because as power bills continue to rise, they also see eating away at their total cost of occupancy. If you use debt or equity for that matter, then this is the classic split incentive. It's worse for the building owner from day one because they've forked out all the money to do the upgrade and the tenant's enjoying all the benefits, so it's great for the tenants. But of course, this is why a lot of retrofits don't occur. Whereas if you use an EUA, you find it can work for both because you can have that transparent engagement with your tenants and you can look to share the benefits. So the tenant's total cost of occupancy initially doesn't increase. They're in a higher rated building, no net increase in their cost of occupancy. Over time, of course, power prices continue to rise. We've all seen the news about the looming increase in gas prices. That protects them. It protects them from that increase as well. So it works for the tenants. There's another way of looking at this, so I'll just go on to the next slide to give you another perspective. So this is the classic case for a building. So what we have, in each box we've got two columns. As you look at it on the uh, left-hand side, you have all the receipts coming into a building. And that's generally made up of the base rent and then the outgoing recoveries that you receive as well. And then on the uh, right-hand side, you have where all that money's applied to. So you've got your tax, capex, other expenses. You've got your debt service for your core debt. You've got your equity yield, and you've got your outgoings. Your outgoings, of course, match your outgoing recoveries. So if you fund an energy efficiency program with debt, you've got no opportunity to increase your base rent until, of course, you get to relet periods. But your debt service has gone up. And that's squeezed your equity yield. It's the reason upgrades aren't happening. Your outgoings have dropped. Great. But so have your outgoing recovery. So there's no real change happening. If you fund it with an appropriate EUA where you've engaged strongly with your tenants, you can see that you can leave yourself in, in a best case scenario completely level. Your debt service hasn't increased because an EUA isn't debt. What you've got now is a council charge. That charge becomes part of your outgoings. And from a so your outgoings recoveries remain the same, your outgoings remain the same, and your equity yields protected. So it gives you an advantage from the get-go. So the next and final point I want to touch on is the process. Because a lot of people can look at this approach and say, well, you've got a number of people to engage with here. It's, you've got tenants, you've got building owners, you've got your project developers, etc. Isn't an EUA rather complex and a long-winded process? And I say no, because it's just a form of finance. This doesn't change whether you should or should not do a retrofit. The retrofit needs to stand on its own two feet to begin with. And all this adds in is two extra processes. So if you look at a, go through the process for an EUA, first off, the building owner scopes out the building, estimates the works, the power savings, etc. Well, that's no different from an ordinary project. Got this second step, which is new. So the building owner and Sustainable Melbourne Fund through Scott need to submit an application form and be approved for the program. That's a short application form and it relies on data that the building owner already has through their energy audits. We complete, complete a credit process, or we already do that anyway for any form of funding, although in this case it's an abbreviated process because we have certain protections. Generally in EUA it's got a low, very low loan to value ratio and uh, the repayments are via the council. And if they're an existing client of the bank, we can shorten it further. Building owner and the financier agree on a letter of offer, which sets out some of the, the terms. It's a template document. Again, that's exactly the same as a traditional loan process. You then have the additional step of agreeing an EUA. But the EUA is a template. It's already been agreed. It's available on the City of Melbourne's website, and all the terms are there. 
It's just the anichers that are customized and they determine what the works are, how much they cost and what the repayments will be. So project specific pieces. Satisfy all your conditions precedent. Know your customer, verification forms, sign the, the actual agreements, et cetera, et cetera. Again, no different from a normal process. Then as the owner, you finalize the work, sign purchase agreements as well as the letter of offer in the EUA. So no, no change there. And then we advance the money on the terms and the monies are repaid. So compared to a traditional loan, you've really only got two extra additional steps to access longer tenor and a lower interest rate and hopefully for a well-structured EUA, good strong tenant engagement as well. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.